Good afternoon. It's another exciting episode of Robin Minds. It is 22nd of December, few days to Christmas, and we're bringing you a Robin Minds special. 12 days of Christmas. I'll be bringing you 12 exciting stories and events this year. Those who dare to change narrative, events that have shaped our culture and challenged our collective schools of thought. Join me on this hour ride of the beautiful things of 2019. <laughs> For my first day of Christmas, we put the spotlight on a global movement, hashtag MeToo, trickling down to Nigeria, and 2019 finally brought us the realization of how vulnerable our women are. This is amplified by the BBC on alleged sex for grades in the University of Lagos, and the very impressive special by YTV with Busola Dakolo. I was happy that someone like her came forward and told her story. And I was happy that a lot of people were paying attention to the fact that this thing happened because there have been so many other people alleging that this pastor did this to them and nobody believed them. So coming out, her coming out was kind of like confirming to say that, yes, this is the kind of person this, this person is. He did this to me too. On the 27th of June, the world woke up to an interview granted by Busola Dakolo with media mogul Chude Jidongo, who, where she alleged that the founder and general overseer of the Commonwealth of Zion Assembly, Pastor Biodu Fatoibo, had raped her over 15 years ago in Ilori. I was first of all like, I couldn't say anything like, what was it this time? So early? But um, immediately I just opened the door just pushed me. He didn't say anything. He didn't, um, he didn't utter any word. He just pushed me to one of the chairs in my living room. And I saw him like he was removing his belt. So I was like, what? He just said, keep quiet. Do what I want you to do and you'll be fine. This was closely followed with another news which broke on the 7th of October. The BBC aired a story by a journalist, Kiki Mordi, about two lecturers, one from the University of Lagos and the other from the Kwame Nkrumah University, Ghana, molesting female students with promises of favours. These students have been going on for years and every single year, every single department, every single student, there's always a story. The whole process of the documentary uh, Sex for Greats that I did with BBC Africa I was such a journey. I mean, we had to do it. It's a problem that we've all known in Nigeria, but somehow no one seems to, you know, properly address it in a significant and impactful way. So we decided to turn the camera on the perpetrator and we, we, we achieved that with the help of a lot of people who were willing to come forward with us uh, and talk to us. And of course, with months of preparation and research, and it wasn't easy, but we got there eventually. But I think something that was so dear and important to me was allowing victims to talk and not feel alone. And I feel like that has happened. Even, you know, even, even though that some victims were not able to speak out, but the feeling of not being alone was sort of enough for me. I did that for, I mean, my 17-year-old self, or my 19-year-old self, rather, who didn't have who didn't feel like there was anyone else in the world that was listening to her. So I think that was an important box for me. Of course, there is the structures that we need to put in place to make sure that it doesn't happen anymore. Uh, that's a box that has been partially ticked, not quite, uh, but we're definitely going to get that. I'm scared when I'm walking down the street. I think people see me as a confident woman, which I am, but I, I fear a lot you know, for my life. I fear for my safety, I fear for my agency because I see people trying to strip my agency from me. When I'm walking down the street, someone wants to just strip me and remind me that I'm a woman. That happens all the time. And of course I'm scared, but I'm just not going to let that fear stop me. As a girl, if you know that you're going to be harassed by a lecturer, then don't go to his office. Don't do this. Don't ask him any questions in class. Make sure you're not noticed. I think that people should understand that that is asking the students to compromise on their education because that is telling them to restrict all relationships with someone that is supposed to be teaching them. The purpose of going to school is to learn. And if the person that is supposed to be helping me learn something, I'm supposed to be hiding from that person. It means that I'm not going to achieve, 
I'm not going to optimize my education. Like, I'm not going to get all that I can get from my lecturer all because I don't want to be sexually harassed by that person. I think that we should take the responsibility off of the students and put more responsibility on the lecturers. It is illegal. It is not just illegal, it's wicked for you to do that to a student and make them feel like they can't graduate or they cannot pass a course if they don't sleep with you or go on dates with you or you just make them feel uncomfortable making sexual lewd comments about their body. It's unfair. You, it, the power dynamic is already, you can already see it, it's clear. There's a lecturer who's a high up here who can make or break you, who can make sure you don't graduate or make sure that you graduate with the worst grades ever. And then there's you, a student. And I know that people will say things like, you need to fight it, you need to do this, you need to do that. I tell you this for free, there are people who have fought this and they never graduated. Kiki. There are people who have fought this and they had to change the course of their career. Me. There are people who just don't even have the luxury of a voice to be able to fight this. And then that's why we're here, to be the voice of the students who don't have strong enough voices to fight this. Again, it's back to the power dynamic of just you know being vulnerable and being taken advantage of in different situations. I'm grateful to be a part of the project, the Sex for Grades project. I was grateful to amplify what everyone had been whispering about because it's, it is pretentious to say that we did not know or we were very surprised to see that um, lecturers were harassing students and to the extent that it was revealed on the documentary. In fact, the documentary was even tamed because some people have been violently raped by their lecturers on campus. There were testimonies like that in their office and there are people around and they've raped people. So um, I think that this is pretentious to act like, it's pretentious to act like we don't know that this has always been happening. And um, more than just being pretentious, I think it's unfair and it's a disservice not just to our survivors but to the education of young people. So many people have had to compromise on their education because they were getting sexually harassed. And I say this all the time to people who say things like, oh, as a girl, if you know that you're going to be harassed by a lecturer, then don't go to his office. Don't do this. Don't ask him any questions in class. Make sure you're not noticed. I think that people should understand that that is asking the students to compromise on their education because that is telling them to restrict all relationships with someone that is supposed to be teaching them the purpose of going to school is to learn. Indeed, it's been a great year for the Me Too movement in Nigeria as women are increasingly speaking up and finding their voices. Speaking about women, Simisola Ajibola, a Nigerian pilot with Airpeace Airlines, professionally piloted an Airpeace Boeing 737 flight from Port Harcourt to Lagos, which according to reports, crash landed at the Moritala Mohammed International Airport, Lagos, amid poor visibility and bad weather. And this was my second day of Christmas. I think that Simisola Ajibola is a hero. And not just her, a lot of other women who are taking up spaces. I think that it's important for girls to take up space. You know what they say, not all heroes wear capes. Thanks to Simisola Ajibola, over a hundred lives were saved on that fateful day. Still in the spirit of Christmas and women doing great things, one of the biggest news that warmed my heart this year was the acquisition of the Lionheart movie by Netflix. And even better, the announcement that the film had been selected by the Nigerian Academy Award Committee for the Oscars, making it the first Nollywood movie to be considered for the prestigious award. To understand how important Genevieve Naji's Lionheart is to Nigerian cinema and the strides that it created, we have to go back a couple of months to uh, late 2018 when uh, Genevieve premiered the film Lionheart at the Toronto International Film Festival and it was the first film in a very long time at the Toronto International Festival as well as the first African film to be bought directly by Netflix before it went into cinemas. What made Lionheart even bigger than 
it already was with the Netflix deal was the fact that the Nigerian Oscar Committee for Oscar selections selected, after numerous submissions or considerations, selected the movie Lionheart as the movie to represent Nigeria at the Oscars. Now, again, that is big. That is a big, big deal. It goes to show that considering the quality, the acting, the story, the impact of the story, they felt like Lionheart was going to be a good representation for the country and for the industry. So if we have more funding, not only in the production, but even investing in cinemas, because that's where the end product is now yeah. for a lot of our films. Yeah. So we need more cinemas. You mentioned cinemas now. It's yes. a very contentious topic yeah. I want to talk about. Because okay. I've had this conversation as well with a few other people in the industry mm -hmm. about the politics of the cinema side of things, mm -hmm. which is not very... A lot of people who are not in the industry don't understand what happens. Okay. You know? I've heard someone complain about, oh, if you are not in a certain clique, mm. you know, you don't get to there certain cinemas or you don't get right uh, good times. They push mm. a movie at 10 a.m. when they know nobody's going to come see it yeah. and all of that. What's, what's happening there? I think the exhibitors, again, I think it comes down to regulation. I think that we need to have a body that says that, yes, it is business. We see that foreign films draw the audiences, but you need to give your cinema, um, your indigenous cinema, some time, okay? Secondly, we can't all make the same types of films, because that's the argument that I have personally heard, yeah. that the films have to be this particular genre for it to sell. Comedy, I hear. Yes, is comedy sells. is the big thing that supposedly sells. But you see, so if you continue to do that, if you do not give other films a chance, yes, we will all die off. Anybody else that wants to make any other type of film and you will have only comedies. And then the Nigerian audience will complain, which they, they tend to. Now, when I say regulation, I think that these organizations must say to these people, you are an exhibitor, be an exhibitor. Because what happens is what muddies the waters is when you're an exhibitor that starts dabbling into production, you give only oh, sorry, your films. Because that, that's happening a lot now where we have cinema, ha lot. cinema houses who are now producing movies. Yes. So you're saying basically that they, they, they produce these movies and basically they give their, give own, their films, own films the better times, the better times yes, and the better days the and more, maybe a longer running period of even, course. over anybody else. Of course. Because, does, I mean, it makes sense. If I invest in something, I'm going to give it the best chance it can. But then you now starve the rest of us of any chance because you're focused so much on that one that Selling is, your you know, product. Your, your own product. Yeah. So I think that there has to be some changes there so that it works for both parties. Again, I will keep saying, I understand to a degree that when it comes down to business, when it comes down to those numbers, yeah. when you're crunching your numbers and this is what makes sense, it makes sense for you to continue to do that. But when a government says that they're trying to develop entertainment, it's not just by paying lip service to it, it's by actually doing something about yeah. it. And these are some of the things they can do not just giving us intervention funds. Because you give Proper me the laws. funds. So for now, it's not illegal what they're doing? It's not illegal because it hasn't been it's deemed just unethical, illegal. unethical, maybe? Yes. I think it's unethical. Yeah. But then you are the lawyer. You tell me <laughs> if it's anywhere in our yeah. laws. Still on the entertainment industry, it's safe to say that this year has been a great one for award-winning singer, Burner Boy. of his new album, African Giant, which has gotten global recognition and winning many awards such as the Young Person of the Year at the Future Awards Africa and the Best International Act at the BET Awards. Many of us were not surprised when on the 20th of November, the Grammy Awards announced the nomination of Burner Boy's album in the World Album category. So for my fifth day of Christmas, you guys know how much I love this show. It's been one of the shows that has taken Nigeria by storm and produced so many superstars. Of course, I'm speaking of the Big Brother Nigeria reality show, which held its fourth season in Lagos. This, of course, made my fifth day of Christmas.
I lost a couple of uh, friends, just very few of them. But then um, the people who are who were close to me before the fame, they're still very close to me right now because nothing has changed. I'm still the Cynthia they used to know. Um, just that now I'm more, you know, out there. But of course, um, for some people couldn't handle the fame, and so they're like, okay, CC, I'm not sure. I want to be part of all that, which is fine. I can understand. Now for my sixth day of Christmas, we are going to be talking about my favorite thing in the world. Money. Of course, you know I'm an evil man. I love it. <laughs> Let's take a look. So the ease of doing business uh, intervention is one that is dear to everybody's heart. Uh, it's dear to the vice president. Immediately the minister was appointed. This was a priority area he wanted to focus on. Uh, it's dear to other uh, agencies in uh, MITI, like uh, NIPC, NEPC. Uh, it's something that sits on the heart of trade and investment in Nigeria. So because of that, we've all come together to deliver an agenda. And over the last, let me say three years, we worked in a strategic, systemic manner. The Presidential Enabling Business Environment Council was inaugurated in July of 2016. It has, like I said, the Vice President as Chair and the Minister as Vice Chair has about 10 other ministers, Minister of Power, Minister of Finance, Minister of Foreign Affairs Information. It has other people like the Central Bank Governor, of course the Head of Civil Service as members. It has representation from the private sector. Data was expanded to have representation from state governments, Lagos and Kano State have representatives on the council. It also has representation from the National Assembly and from the judiciary. Nigeria has been blessed with good resources in terms of talent and people and when we have people and companies go to other countries where it's easier we see how they perform and so how do you make that something that can come to bear here. Nigeria's 15th place rise on the World Bank's 2020 Doing Business Index was received this year by many Nigerians as a welcome development. We are now ranked 131st from 146th last year and up 39 places since 2016. The rise essentially means that the government has decided to finally take action on the reforms we were expecting around businesses, making registration of businesses easier, doing things about tax administration, making registering property easier. There are a few other components of the ease of doing business rankings. Another thing is enabling cross-border tr trade. They've one of the things they've done over the years from when Pebec was started was streamlining the import and export process at the ports, reducing the number of agencies you have to go through before you can export your goods or import your goods, and making the process more transparent. Another one was, where's it go? Making business registration easier, which is by, what's it called? They improved the processes at the Corporate Affairs Commission, which is that you can do your company registration online, you can pay the fees online, they integrated both the stamp duties process with the Corporate Affairs Commission process. So you can do everything online without having to go to the offices, except in the rare case in which maybe you have an hitch in your registration. All these are commendable to be truthful. We were in a really bad spot before. We were 146. We were one of the lowest on the continent even. And then we moved up 31 places, um, 30 something places to 131st, um, 18 places actually to one to the first, which is quite good. Now for my seventh day of Christmas, I will be highlighting another news that also made my day and further proves that Nigerian entrepreneurs are winning and winning big. This year, one of Nigeria's leading technology innovation centers, CC Hub, acquired Kenya's iHub in a new deal. Uh, well, CC Hub is a technology innovation center. Um, uh, we largely incubate uh, technology startups but we also work with civil society and, and government to find smart ways to use technology. It was exciting. Um, it was one of those moments where, um, like I'm lost for words now, so it's just one of those moments. It was big, it was big for, for CCO. It was a turning point uh, in our history. Um, a lot of limelight. Uh, but also shine light on, on some of the startups and, and young people that we supported. 
Co-creation hub, the leading technology innovation center in Nigeria, has acquired Kenya's iHub for an undisclosed fee. Now, the deal will see iHub's team become part of CC Hub's wider central support and strategy network, whilst retaining its name and senior management structure. Now, still on Nigeria, a particular event this year made my list for my 12 days of Christmas. A lot of people may have forgotten about this national event. I'm speaking of none other than the Nigerian elections. Personally, I'm always excited to know that citizens have the right to choose their government through a voting process. Now, this is the bedrock of every democracy, and that's why this is one of my favorite 12 things about Christmas. General elections were held in Nigeria on the 23rd of February to elect the President, Vice President, House of Representatives, and the Senate. In December 2014, Muhammad Buhari, then general, after he won the APC primaries in Lagos State, Teslim Balogun Stadium, he stood up and promised Nigerians restructuring. He tied himself to restructuring. Eventually, he got into power. The man said he doesn't understand what restructuring is. We said we will do end power. We said we will give direct jobs to young people. And you can check in every local government in this country, 500,000 young people are, are, are employed. Just let's be very clear. I'm just saying that there are a lot of parameters that that's coming into play now. But the ultimate goal is to defeat the old order. And that is... No way. This, that victory is non-negotiable. Is you regret being a part of that? It was a gaffe, and I apologized to my followers because I gave it more credibility than it should have had. Yeah, it was not a, a sincere process. The elections had initially been scheduled for the 16th of February, but the election commission postponed the votes by a week at 3 a.m. on the original polling day, citing logistical challenges in getting materials to polling stations on time. As a politician, you're running for office. Mm -hmm. uh, your, your election was supposed to hold yesterday. By now, you should be knowing or is getting a feel of whether you are, mm -hmm. uh, what the results would be. Um, what, how, was the, how did that come to you? Because people thought of maybe some politicians knew. Mm -hmm. You guys are the stakeholders, quote unquote. How did you get the results of, of the news? So you know, you know the funny thing, um, there were rumors through the grapevine. In fact, when I, when I was preparing to run for office three, four months ago, a seasoned politician told me categorically, Banky W, these elections will not hold on the day that they've announced. As far because, back as then. As far back as then, because they've never hold, held on, the, on day. the day that we say that they're going to hold it. The last three election cycles, you said it already, the last three elections, they've always been postponed. So, you know, coming up to the day, we, we thought, okay, maybe they will be postponed. And then every time you would hear from INEC, it's like, no, it's going to hold, it's going to hold, it's going to hold. So, you know, it's particularly painful to kind of smaller campaigns, independent campaigns like mine, because, you know, you, you throw everything against the wall the night before. There's, there's not one T-shirt left, no poster. You've spent everything that you have just throwing it against the wall, saying, okay, tomorrow is the D-Day. And then you find out that they've moved it a week. So I don't know about other people. We have an agent network of 300 plus people who we had to house, feed, pay, you know, 350 people, this entire matrix of just for moving the, for elections. just for elections to mobilize. Is that for agents elections. for your polling units? Agents for okay. the polling units, mobilizers, welfare, monitors, the coalition center people, the person who's going to be at the, you know, so you have this entire network of people that you've kind of green lit thinking the night before everything is fine. And now we have to do it again a week from now. I don't even know where we start from. Now, for the first time, we had a huge number of young people vying for elective positions. This can be said to be a result of the success of the Not Too Young to Run movement. The young to, Not Too Young to Run movement has been successful. Uh, but I don't think it's the end goal. Yes, we were successful in amending the law. We were successful in getting a lot of young people to the ballot. Um, we recorded some wins, um, not just ordinary wins, but even wins when it comes to being speakers, commissioners, and whatnot. So the, the, the message of the young people is being heard. Uh, but I personally, I think there's a whole lot more to do. Um, the young people aspect is one thing. Democracy in itself in Nigeria is another thing. And there's a lot more sensitization and engagement that needs to be done. Um, I, for example, think that we need to enlighten ourselves more. Um, both young and old need to understand the importance of your integrity, not integrity of just the politicians, integrity of the voter when it comes to the ballot. I think that should be the next step. Uh, so let's see where we go from here.
on a bit of a more personal personal level with okay. you now. Um, I mean, you're young, you're running for office. A lot of people are, quote unquote, afraid of politics mm. really within this age bracket. How mm. has it been for you so far? What has your experience been in politics? My experience. Because I come from a completely <laughs> different genre. Yeah, you're yeah. entertainment, you're a musician. Yeah. How has it been? Here's the thing. On the one hand, it's, it's kind of been like a tale of two sides. Um, on the one hand, it's been challenging, it's been difficult, it's been stressful, it's been tedious. It's been one of the most difficult journeys I've ever embarked upon. But on the other side, it's been one of the most rewarding things that I've ever done, and I would do it again in a heartbeat. It's enlightening. You learn more about people in three months of doing politics <laughs> than in some years put together. I've learned so much about people in the grassroots, people who you think are your friends who aren't, people, <laughs> do you understand? Like, you, you just learn so much. It's such a learning experience that I'm wiser now than I was three months ago, which is insane because it's not like I was foolish to start with. But I've just learned so much in this, in this period. And, and part of what I'm trying to do is to inspire other people. Yeah. Inspire you. It's time, for, it's, time for, it's time for the brightest amongst us to step up and come to the table because who are we waiting for? There's, yeah. They're not coming. There's no Messiah person that's going to come, you know, that's going to, Messiah president that's going to turn Nigeria around in an instant. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. If we want the country to turn around, then we've all got to get involved. And while I tip my hat to the people running for president, I'm trying to inspire credibility to run for offices. some of these other offices, House of Reps, State House of Assembly, Senate local government chairman. Let's infiltrate the system because those ones are infinitely winnable. We can win those. We can infiltrate government. We can find like minds. We can work together. We can build capacity. We can't all be president. <laughs> you know, leave that one first. Let the, let the people that fight for that fight for that. But let's start, let's start getting some of these other things. Let's, you know, the problem in Nigeria, I've said this many times, the problem in Nigeria is from the top down. But personally, I believe the solution is from the bottom up. So let's get people, the brightest among us, it's time for us to come to the table. And that's what I'm trying to inspire. It's not just about me, it's about our entire generation. It is pretty obvious that there's, there are problems with yeah. the way these things have been set up. And we end up suffering the brunt of it. So I think, I think it's a, a call to action. I think it's a wake-up call. I think we need to sit down and look again. Do you know that Macron cannot be chairman of INEC? The president of France cannot be chairman of INEC because he's too young. So, 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 so let's, let's understand that, yes, the not too young to run bill was a good thing and that it became a law is a good thing. But there are still age limits on many federal parastatals that say, unless you are this, you cannot mm -hmm. be appointed into this position. But if we're talking about elections and moving, there's a lot of moving pieces. You need, you need youth there. You need... People who are young, who can move fast, people who are familiar with technology, that, you know. So it's like, we got not too young to yeah. run, to pass, that's step one, but now how about not too young to get the job done? You know, how about we, we start understanding that it's, it's, it, you know, it's not even about getting young people in, it's about getting credibility in, it's about getting expertise in. Yeah. How about we do that? Incumbent President Muhammadu Buhari won his re-election bid, defeating his closest rival, Atiku Abubakar, by over three million votes. He, of course, was sworn in on the 29th of May, 2019, the former date of Democracy Day. Now, this one is for my Nigerian movie lovers. The box office statistics for October released by the Cinema Exhibitors Association of Nigeria showed a slow but positive change for the domestic film industry with some Nollywood films now ranking in as much as Hollywood films in the Nigerian box office. I would like to say that I feel like it is a work in progress, right? So um, in as much as there are a couple of movies that have come, you know, a couple of Nigerian films that have shown at the cinemas that have done incredibly well, there's still, there's still a lot more that keeps showing every week that don't do as well, right? So you have movies that come and do two weeks, you have movies that come and do three weeks, right? So right now the movies are doing well based on a giant marketing budget, which in itself is not bad and which in, which in itself is needed for any film. As regards to box office records that were released, which showed that Nollywood movies are doing extremely well at the cinemas, earning as much as, if not more than, some Hollywood blockbusters, I think that is 
amazing. I think this means that Nigerians are starting to give Nollywood movies chances at the cinemas. I think Nigerians have realized that, or they are starting to realize that the industry is not only growing in size, but in terms of quality of picture and storytelling, the industry is getting better with each year that passes by and with each production. So there are some fantastic movies that are making it to the cinemas and people are loving these movies and thereby able to come back for more. So I think it just means that Nigerians are starting to open their minds to Nollywood movies, which is a great thing. What Nigerian movies broke records this year? This year we're looking at, I mean, quite a few Nigerian movies did, did well, but I think movies such as The Set Up broke some records. And then you have most recently Elevator Baby, which I heard did extremely well. It had a very long run at the cinemas. And what that means is that when a movie stays at the cinemas for eight weeks, nine weeks, ten weeks, that means people are demanding these movies. And so cinema owners are unable to pull it out because people keep coming back for it, which is a good thing. And of course, the biggest movie we've had yet this year is Living in Bondage, the sequel, which is an amazing fantastic movie that deserves all the records it's been breaking unfortunately i don't think we've had any movie break the record king of boys broke last year but still i mean the biggest movie so far this year is living in bondage uh, breaking free the sequel now for the big 10 i'll be speaking on a young man who took the world by storm and has become a cultural phenomenon Anthony Joshua lost to Andy Ruiz earlier this year in a surprising win that saw Andy Ruiz take this world heavyweight title. However, just a few weeks ago, a rematch was had and Anthony came back and reclaimed his title. The party pride of London, England, and once again, the heavyweight champion of the world, the man known as AJ, Anthony. I wasn't exactly shocked. I, I sort of saw it coming, but he had no business losing, losing that, that, um, that first bout. But having said so, credit to him, he went back, he didn't complain, he didn't whine. He corrected whatever was wrong from the first match. So over the past couple of years, um, Anthony has been a breath of fresh air in the heavyweight category. He's handsome, he's got charisma, um, he's, a, he's a good guy, he's a nice guy, you know. He, he doesn't do all of the trash talking, but he still connects with the audience. The audience still, you know, absolutely love him. And, you know, he's had a couple of really, really big fights, um, famously knocking out um, Klitschko, one of the Klitschko brothers, um, to become, on, well, pretty much undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. And from that point on, um, the feeling will be, who could stop him? He had a couple of more fights after that. I mean, one has predicted. Um, and then Andy Ruiz came along. Um, you've got to be clear that Andy Ruiz was not part of the plan. If anything, he was um, sort of like, a detour on a well-laid path to Anthony Joshua ruling the world. In the spirit of Christmas, we're making a list of my 12 days of Christmas. The people and events that I would say left the most mark for me this year. Just before we went on a break, we spoke about a sports hero, Anthony Joshua, and how he has taken the world by storm. Now, talking about taking the world, my 11th favorite thing this year, the queen herself, Beyonce, released her seventh studio album, Gift, and it featured over six Nigerian artists. We also saw Cardi B coming to Nigeria and having the concert of her life and having the best time in Lagos. I was in LA, I was in Los Angeles um, for something totally different. And I was um, spoken about the project, I mean, invited to meet with the people organizing the whole stuff. I mean, Beyonce team. And of course, I, I went for the meeting. I was invited by a lady called Vanessa Amadi, who apparently works with the um, David O. And on getting there, I didn't really know what they were, you know, going to say until, you know, they mentioned about me working on the project. And yeah, and <laughs> that's how it all kicked off. And I came back the next day and they played the old songs. 
and I was able to do what I can do. I'll break it down into two. You know? The first one is, it's not really for me, it's, it's for Africa, you know. It's more like I see myself more as an ambassador, really, because most people don't know me as someone that can sing. And basically, I find myself in a situation where they told me to, you know, to do what I know how to do that a lot of people don't know about. And, and of such, you know, everybody tends to like have that confused mind that is Bankuli really an a and r or is he a musician or whatever, you know. You know, these are something I do in the background that a lot of people don't know about. Like I was on so many other, you know, so many songs that a lot of people, you know, they sing but they don't know. I'm the one doing the background vocals. The banjo, yeah, that's my voice there. There are some people, they want to make her cry. Some people, they, yeah, that's me. I was doing some background and vocals. And before that Beyonce project as well, I was on What the Throne album, Jay-Z, Kanye West. Yeah, it's all there. And um, I was on the Jesus album for Kanye as well. So basically, I, I feel maybe when my name pop up, you know, they felt, you know, I would be valuable and I was able to do my beat. Afrobeats, you know, sound, music genre, is one of the fastest growing music genre in the world. And it's an exciting sound, you know, it's multifaceted, you know, sound. We are talking of, you know, Davido sound, whiskey, Tiwa, Rema. You know, it's, it's an exciting genre. You find a lot of people, you know, downloading the song, dancing to, to the song on, you know, on social media, on all social media platforms. So, internet has helped in pushing the narrative of the genre. So. Uh, and, and of course, the whole world is, you know, they want to be part of it. Anything women are dancing to, and it's exciting to anybody, you know, your next man. You, you, that in, you, you are inquisitive, you, you want to know what's going on there. And every time they see people, you know, dance or sing Afrobeat, they see they're happy. It's a, it's a kind of genre that excites the soul. It excites the body, you know. People want to move, you know. People want to forget their sorrow, they want to dance. They don't want to talk about their problem, they can come back and revisit it. So, for me, you know, it's, it's an interesting period for Nigerian music, for African music, for African sound, because a lot of people really want to, you know, they want to be part of it, you know, and that's how life is generally. When something is going good, everybody wants to be part of it. And there's another thing about the genre, it has potential to, you know, to mix with other, other culture which whether you like it or not, you can see the kind of collaborations that are coming up. Beyonce collaborating with that kind of numbers of, you know, musicians from this side shows they really want to exploit that sound. They want to see what it can bring. And of course, we all see what, what came out of the album. And beyond that, there are so many other collaborations. David Doe, Chris Brown, you know, Whiskey and other artists around the world. Like that, Mr. Easy, Tiger, you know, that blend of culture also helps the genre to get bigger. As you can see, the likes of um, Cardi B coming to Nigeria, and um, for that space of time that she's, uh, she was around, if you're very familiar with what she has done, you must have known that somebody must have coached her about what the culture, about what the lifestyle is about. And whether you like it or not, yeah, things might not be the way it's supposed to be with the way the government is being, I mean, they are running government in Nigeria. But that doesn't stop the lifestyle, the good people, you know, our culture, our way of life, you know. And whether you like it or not, the more, you know, those kind of sound comes out from one, two, three, four, five, six. DJ Snake is one of the most streamed um, independent DJs in the world. He has done over probably a billion or two billion streams. Do you know what that is? For him to now do a remix of Maradona, that's huge, you know. Now we're almost at the end of the show and my last day of Christmas. The internet was taken by storm with pictures of many Nigerian celebrities in Dubai for the African Music Festival, which was held and successfully gathered a lot of attention from the whole world. This is Africa to the world. <laughs> Okay, so going to Dubai.
Dubai was a very interesting experience. I had the opportunity to meet with other amazing, um, other amazing people from other parts of the world, other parts of the continent. I, I had the opportunity to to watch Whiskey perform. I had the opportunity to watch Tiba Savage perform, and I had the opportunity to also meet with other amazing artists all around the world. And of course, it is Dubai. It's a very amazing experience. And we had to, we had the opportunity to experience the fun, the food, the music, the love, and it was a very interesting performance and experience.
Thank you very much for joining me, and I'm afraid that's the end of our show today. Don't forget to tweet at us using the hashtag Robin Minds about your 12 days of Christmas. Also use the hashtag 12 days of Christmas. Next week, we'll be having the last show of the year, and I'll be bringing you another special. I'll be bringing you my 10 most fascinating things, and I'll be holding live at the Robin Minds Amphitheater. For a chance to win a ticket, and all you have to do is simply tweet with the hashtag Robin Minds telling us about your own favorite things. Have a very lovely week. And do have a Merry Christmas.